I miss my kids dearly. Um, and that was really hard. I woke up at five o'clock every morning and I went to bed at like midnight and I just did content consumption. And I went through all the modules and I took notes and I was reading books and I was listening to podcasts. Um, literally for, for the entire day, I was taking some sort of content and that really kind of put me ahead of the pack. And by the end of the eight weeks, I was calling brokers and community bankers and trying to get financing and underwriting. And, you know, uh, I, I had my brother, Greg, you know, traveling all over, you know, the, the Carolinas and, and Virginia, uh, trying to find properties and walking properties that, you know, that we were finding and stuff. And um, had I not done that, I don't know that we would have had the, um, the really the rise to kind of the success that we've seen so far so quick. Um, but, you know, that was really kind of, you know, how we got started. Warren Buffett once said, if you don't learn to make money while you sleep, you're going to work until you die. I'll let that sink in for a minute. Because in today's show, we're going to be talking in great depth about the term passive income, specifically with the asset class of multifamily real estate investing. And with our guest today, Tim Lyons. So let me tell you a little bit about Tim. First of all, guy is an outstanding individual, somebody that is a client of ours on the marketing firm side, and is just absolutely crushing it when it comes to real estate syndication. Tim and his brother, Greg Lyons, are literally taking that industry by storm. So let me tell you a little bit about Tim. So Tim is a 15-year veteran of the New York City Fire Department and is currently serves as a lieutenant in the borough of Queens. Until recently, he worked part-time as an emergency room uh, RN at a level one trauma center. And he brings years of real-world management and leadership experience to his real estate career and his real estate investment career. Tim's initial goal with real estate was to create passive income and in turn be able to spend more time with his family, right? Um, he has three beautiful little girls, a fantastic wife, uh, and wants to spend a little more time with them, like many of us want to with our loved ones. After partnering on a multifamily property, he saw firsthand the power of real estate investing and how an opportunity to create passive income and build wealth for his family could really change his life. So from there, he started Cityside Capital with the goal of not only growing his own portfolio, but also being able to help others realize the power of investing in real estate and creating passive income and building wealth. Again, let's go back to Warren's quote, passive income is crucial. And if we aren't as individuals creating these streams, we're doing ourselves a disservice. Once we stop working, we stop earning. So Cityside Capital has now today, just a few short years later, 45 million of assets under management, including 335 multifamily units. And Tim has also invested in, uh, as a limited partner in a 256 multi, uh, multifamily units uh, in Texas in a large retail super center in Tennessee. This guy is literally, as you'll hear as we get into our show today, he is 100% committed to this over the course of a couple of years. This is a guy who didn't know what cap rate and, and all these fancy terms met. And right now he is one of the thought leaders in the industry, uh, really helping people create and generate those passive streams of income. So with that said, let's introduce this uh, New York City firefighter hero and real estate juggernaut, Tim Lyons. All right, buddy, welcome Tim Lyons to the show. Tim, what's up, my man? Thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate you. Yeah, Derek, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. So, Tim, in the intro, I brought something up which just kind of boggles my mind with your line of work. Um, you had you told me uh, that in the past you don't like to get wet. And by that, I mean, like if someone shoots you in the face with a squirt gun, maybe you get just smashed with a water balloon and, and water hits you that uh, that just that just kind of sidelines you. And explain to me how uh, somebody who doesn't like getting wet ends up dealing with a high powered, high pressured water hose for a living as a New York city firefighter. Like just trying to just try and understand that. <laughs> Does sound a little strange. I know. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what it is. I, I hate being wet. Right. And now when probably when I say this now, when people hear this podcast, they're going to shoot me in the face with a water gun. But um, yeah, like my, my, my kids, like when we're in the pool and like, they'll just blast me in the face with a water gun or something like I hate that or you know, if it's raining out, like when I, when I was in college and if, if it was raining out, uh, Derek, I didn't go to class that day. I just, I took a, I took a rain day. 
<laughs> so, so I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know where it came from. I don't know if that's some childhood trauma. I have no idea, but I just do. I, if I don't want to be wet, I don't like being wet. <laughs> so now I, I know with the fire gear, like you got a, you got a mask on, right. And you got a ton yeah. of gear. So maybe you're not really getting wet or is, is it, uh, yeah, you thing? know, like when, when we're in a fire dude, like there's so much, um, adrenaline going and, you know, um, so much excitement kind of, you know, coursing through your veins that like, I don't notice that I'm wet until it's like February and it's like six degrees outside and you step out of the fire building and you start freezing to death. Mm -hmm. Um, But even then, like, you know, the rest of the day, like when you have a sick job, like, you know, I I, I truly don't mind. I mean, I don't love it, but I don't mind. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a little bit strange that a firefighter hates to be wet, but um, no, it's just one of those things. I'm a strange guy. So but I'm all yours for the next hours. So what no, else? I, 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 I appreciate that. We'll try to keep you dry. We'll try to keep you dry. So, you, um, so, we're, so let's talk about your, 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 your career, uh, not, not the real estate side, which we're going to get into, which we're super excited to talk to you about, but, but the day in the life of a New York city firefighter, right? Obviously in New York city, every firefighter, I think people have a great degree of admiration or appreciation for. So, I think I speak on behalf of all the listeners that we appreciate your service uh, and what you do every day, putting your life on the line. Uh, but tell us and give us, cause I, I've done some work with you before in the past. Uh, we have a bit of a relationship and, and I, like you sleep at a firehouse. Like there's a whole, it's like a whole different type of, uh, um, of a career path. And I think people will be interested to understand like what's a typical day in the life of Tim Lyons firefighter, um, not the real estate stuff, but the fight and fire stuff, uh, we already, we've already yeah. understood how you get wet, but uh, outside of that, uh, if you can help us understand that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, so I wanted to be a firefighter since I came out of the womb. I, uh, I just, I, whenever I saw a fire truck as a little kid, I begged my mom to death if she could go follow it. Right. And I, I didn't want her to follow it following the, the uh, red light system on the streets. Like I wanted her to take the red lights. I wanted her to get right behind the fire truck and find out what they were doing. You know, um, you know, when I was eight, Santa Claus bought me a police scanner and I uh, quickly attached that thing to my bike and I would go out for hours and just kind of listen to the scanner and, you know, ride around town, chasing the fire engines and seeing what they were doing. And um, I just could never shake it. I just couldn't shake it. And then uh, obviously 9-11 happened. Uh, I'm from the greater New York City area. I grew up in a town called Mineola, which is on Long Island. So a lot of the, you know, it's a middle class community and a lot of the people in that town and surrounding towns are firefighters and cops and, um, you know, business people as well. So like a lot of people like my dad commuted into the city. So it was really personal to me. I was at Providence College on 9-11 as a sophomore and, um, my uncle Al was a captain in the New York city fire department and he was on the front page of the uh, papers the next morning or maybe two days after because he had brought a, uh, brought a special radio with him uh, on the nine 11, you know, on nine 11, he was in charge of the fire boats. So he took the boat from Brooklyn into Manhattan. He walked up to the world trade center, got crushed by tower two, but he was able to communicate with the borough dispatcher directly. And he was able to tell them exactly where he was um, and he is actually deemed like one of the last people pulled out alive. Um, oh, wow. so he was put on a boat, the boat that he came over on, they put him on a boat and they put him over into Jersey city medical center. Cause, uh, I don't know. I don't know why they did that, but, um, and he spent a lot of time over there, very gruesome injuries. Uh, he's still with us to this day. Um, but that really inspired me. Uh, you know, I was in college, I was maybe going to be a doctor. I was going to be a wall street guy. I don't know what I was going to do, but that day I said to myself, I'm going to be a New York city firefighter. I just couldn't, I couldn't not think about the true heroism and bravery of those guys and girls, uh, on that day. And I wanted to be part of that. So, um, I finished out college. I knew I was going to get, um, uh, the job, uh, two weeks after my uh, graduation date. Uh, so while everybody else was like stressing out over resumes, I was, you know, uh, super excited to be in the Academy. Um, but yeah, I became a New York city firefighter as a 22, 22 year old guy. I was loving it. Like it was the greatest job. It still is the greatest job. I can honestly tell you that I have, I feel like I haven't worked truly worked a day in my life. Um, I have the biggest smile, uh, on my face when I have to go to the firehouse. Cause I know that I'm going to have a 24 hour period with nonstop laughter and, um, every day is different, right? So you asked 
that's a long, that's a long way to say, you know, what's a day in the life of a firefighter. But, you know, we get to the firehouse, you know, if we're working um, like a morning time, 24, we'll get there at like 730, you know, eight o'clock in the morning uh, for nine o'clock start. You know, it's one of those jobs where uh, early is on time and, you know, everybody kind of brings something in. And if you don't, you know, the guys will let you know, you know, hey, uh, you know, Tim, what, what did you bring in today? You know, um, but yeah, we have like a like a potluck bre- breakfast and it's a raucous kitchen table. You know, we've got the news on or ESPN and we're talking about, you know, solving all the world's problems at the kitchen table. Um, because, you know, in the in every firehouse, probably across the country, the kitchen is really where the hub of everything kind of happens. There's usually a humongous kitchen table usually some chairs or some couches or something. And it's like the, it's like the heartbeat of the firehouse. Um, and then, you know, across the entire fire boroughs of New York city, there's kind of like a schedule and um, it's just, you know, from the old days of, of the firehouse, it's kind of like a paramilitary type of experience, right? There's a hierarchy of, you know, uh, ranks, you know, firefighters, lieutenants, captains, chiefs, um, and everybody kind of has a, a, a job to do. So like, for example, at nine 30, Every New York City firehouse, if you're not out on a call at 930 in the morning, you start what's called committee work and you're stripping the beds, you're making the beds, you're doing the laundry, you're mopping the floors, you're sweeping, um, you know, spraying down the, uh, the kitchen tables, you know, dishwashing, you know, all that stuff takes place at 930, no matter what firehouse you walk into. Uh, it's kind of cool. And, um, you know, once that's done, we do probably a quick drill on something like you do a, a drill of the day. So we might take a tool off the truck and, and drill on that. Or we might drive over to a building that we just had a fire in and the guys that weren't working will go through, you know, what happened. You know, somebody will walk us through and we'll kind of just do like a, uh, you know, an armchair quarterback type thing, you know, uh, a look back. You know, um, and then everybody gets hungry, you know, so the New York City firehouse is a great place to eat. Um, Derek, you have a you have an open invitation. Anytime you're in New York City, uh, you oh, got to stop by in. the firehouse. Yeah. And uh, you and Amy will have to uh, have some have some chow. So uh, so we actually take the truck. And we go over to the supermarket. We get some 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 food. Uh, sometimes we get it, you know, for both the night and the day. Um, come back. The guys make a fantastic meal. And then I, you know, as a lieutenant, I have to go up and do my own office duties, pay all the guys and girls and uh, take care of the emails and whatnot. And, it, you know, I work in a pretty, pretty busy firehouse. So uh, we do roughly 5,000 runs per year. So in between all that happening, we're in and out, in and out, in and out, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, uh, same thing in the afternoon, after lunch, you know, could, could be doing a drill, we could have a building inspection. Um, and the whole time, you know, it's just, um, it's exciting, because you never know what's going to happen once you roll out the door. Um, you know, I wrote a chapter in a book this year. And one of the lines that I wrote, uh, that I really like is that, I've had a tremendous amount of great days filled with joy and laughter and, and fulfillment and uh, whatever other nice adjective I, you know, you, you could think of, but then there's been a, a handful of absolutely soul sucking, um, tremendously sad days um, when a firefighter dies in the line of duty or we recently, uh, about a month and a half ago, had a two-year-old uh, die in a fire that my guys pulled out and did CPR in the street. Um, so, I mean, it, there's there's those days, right? So, um, and it crushes us, you know, because a lot of us have little kids and I know it sounds cliche, but I mean, it it's one of those things where like when I come home and I, I'll tell my wife like what happened or she'll see it on the news, you know, like. I, I, I look back and I'm like, I can't believe I was there. Like, I can't believe my guys were the ones that pulled that baby out or we put that fire out or, you know, it seems so ordinary to me, but then when I come home and I actually have time to reflect and talk to other people about it, or they, they'll call me and ask me about it. It is kind of surreal, you know, um, not a lot of people have an opportunity to be involved in a, in a kind of profession like that. So um i can go on and on i love it it's um i've been doing it just over 16 years i'm a lieutenant now uh which means that i get to sit in the front seat uh you know and do the nice. sirens and honk the horn you know it was always oh, a lifelong that, dream that's yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say it's, it just goes you know? back to you when you're on your bicycle yeah. chasing that thing yeah so you i you know it's funny i i i almost i i was going to visit my mom the other day and i was going down the street and sometimes those sirens like 
if if the homeboy in the front isn't cranking that horn a lot like you don't you don't always hear it so i took a left and the 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 fire truck was in my lane coming straight at me and i had to i had to dive into the bushes um with my car because he was going around a car in in that lane and I was like, my gosh, those guys that navigate and drive, like to me, I have a, you know, I have a, you know, midsize SUV. It's pretty easy to navigate it, but he was able to jostle out of the way too with this, you know, it's like a tank uh, that's filled with water. Right. So I yeah. can't imagine mm -hmm. it drives like a, like a, you know, like a Maserati or something, right. It's probably a little, does it slosh when you drive that fire truck around? Did you, I mean, or is it pretty stable? It, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it, the engine and technology that has definitely like uh, increased over the years, right? So, I mean, the engine companies, the ones with the hoses on the back, they generally have like, I mean, in New York City, they have 500 gallons of water. You know, that's oh, pretty wow. heavy. That's um, really heavy. So our stopping power, you know, we have these tremendously uh, industrial sized brakes on these things. But I mean, it, um, yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard, you know, and you, you can kind of tell like if the fire truck is cooking down the street, you know, with like the horn constantly going, like they're probably going to a fire. If they're they kind of like hitting the horn a little bit, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you can kind of get a sense, like you know, um, you know, you know, is it a mer real emergency or like maybe not so much, but, uh, but yeah, the guys, you know, by and large, you know, you learn on the job, so um, you know, you don't you don't start off as a chauffeur. We call it a chauffeur at the firehouse. Uh, you know, um, awesome, you know, but, you know, in New York city, there's so many people and not only the cars, but the people you have to watch out for, you know, it's, it's yeah. insane. Um, double park cars are my favorite. I mean, it's do whatever you want day in New York city right now, um, because of the political climate. So people just mm -hmm. park their cars wherever, you know, like, um, but yeah, I mean, these guys, they're, they're pretty skilled. They're, they're, they're pretty skilled. Yeah. It's always pretty, it's always pretty impressive how you all maneuver that big engine. So it, and it's, it's an admiral career. So again, I, you know, I think I speak on behalf of everybody that we, we appreciate your service and, it's amazing because having knowing you and knowing that this is your career, this is how you've you know you've made a living, and you transitioned into another career. For those who are watching the show, if you look over uh, Tim's right hand shoulder on the screen, you'll see uh, the sign "City Side Capital," um, which is uh, uh, well, you know, and I'm not going to give away the thunder here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about City Side Capital and who you are, and then let's kind of get into what you do. Yeah. So, um, I've always been a hard worker. Uh, you know, a lot of guys in the firehouse have second jobs, right? Cause we work 24 hours at a time and then we'll have anywhere from three to four, two to, I would say two to four days off, depending on, you know, we have a, a special calendar that we follow. So, you know, if you wanted to, um, you could work two 24s a week, generally speaking, and have the rest of the time to yourself, you know, but guys, I would say the majority of firefighters, um, have a second career and a lot of them do like you know um contracting type work plumbers roofers hvac you know uh, home improvement type stuff um but there's people that do pretty much anything i, I bet i bet you that there's guys we have eleven thousand people in the new york city fire department i bet you there's something out there for everybody right so um i i became a nurse um i, I always joke i was pre-med in college for about 15 minutes until i joined a fraternity and um so I've always kind of wanted to be in medicine. So when I got to the firehouse, there was four guys who I worked with who were registered nurses. Um, and they, they talked me into going back into nursing school. They had the nice cars in the driveway. Their wives didn't work. They always had side work when they wanted it. They made good money. So I said, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll become a nurse. So I became a nurse. I uh, did that for nine years. And what I found was I was stuck in what's called the W-2 grind. Um, those two jobs, I ended up in a level one trauma center as in the ER as a per diem nurse. And um, I loved it. You know, the ER is an awesome place to work. It's, you know, the female version of a firehouse kind of, you know, um, mm -hmm. they're tremendous, tremendously hard workers. They're also smart and skilled and we have a great sense of humor and we and we help each other. And it's a really phenomenal place to be a nurse, to, to learn how to be one. And um you know, so I actually really enjoyed that job and I like to work. I like to, you know, be, be useful. Um, I don't do well just sitting around doing nothing. 
So, um, but then I started popping out kids. Well, I, I'm sorry, my wife started popping out kids. And we have three precious little girls, 10, uh, 7, and 2 at the moment. Um, and when they were little, Derek, you know, no one said anything to me when I was out of the house. My wife got to stay home for two years with my oldest. Um, she couldn't talk, right? So even though I missed her terribly and I missed my wife and I missed being a dad kind of while I was working so much, it, it's what we had to do kind of to to afford Christina to be home. And um, even then she's only gone back part time. So, um, but when they got older and they could talk, uh, you know, my wife started to be a little stressed out with the kids a little bit. And, you know, the kids started feeling it. Like I'd come home from a 24 at night, you know, and have a great little night with them. And then they'd wake up in the next morning and I'd be gone by 6.30 in the morning before they wake up. And I wouldn't come home until maybe 7.30, 8 o'clock at night and it's witching hour at my house again. Um, so I was stuck, you know, like I, I was working, you know, we were fine. The bills were getting paid. I'm putting money into my savings accounts and retirement accounts. And we go on vacation twice a year. And, you know, like the whole thing, it, it was fine, but it, I was missing something. I, I was missing the like, financial freedom that people talk about. I was missing my time, you know, and on top of money, like I wanted my time back. Right. So real estate was always one of those things that was kind of in the back of my mind. Um, you know, I'll do that someday, someday when I have more money or someday when I have more time, someday when I have more education, I will get into real estate. And you know, there's actually a term for that, uh, that I now know, but I didn't know back then. It's called the arrival fallacy or the destination fallacy. You know, someday I'll do this and someday I'll do that. <clears throat> and, you know, I had this vision of retiring after 20 years in the firehouse and either going back and get my, uh, my, my master's degree. So I could be a nurse practitioner or a nurse anesthetist. And I would get right back into a W2 job, but I'd have my pension and my benefits and the more I got into real estate and the more I got sort of getting educated about financial, um, you know, topics, taxes and, and monetary policy and all that stuff, I was realizing that I was on the, the wrong side of the equation. I was in the, you know, if anybody's read Robert Kiyosaki's book, The Cash Flow Quadrant, um, it, it's a great book, by the way. It's the number two book you should read uh, behind Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, but it really goes over like if you're, you know, he breaks down, you know, if you can picture the top left quadrant, if you draw it like, you know, draw a line down, draw a line across, top left is the employee, the E, the E quadrant. And if you're a W-2 employee or you're a 1099 worker, a gig worker, or something like that, you know, you're taxed at the absolute highest rates and there's very minimal, you know, tax write-offs, right? There's very, there's minimal tactics that you can uh, take to bring your taxable income down. And, you know, when I started to realize that, I'm like, holy cow, like I'm working the first four or five months a year just to pay my tax liability, you know, and I, I you know, yeah. uh, I didn't have a tax strategy, right? So uh, anyway, so this all came to me, I'm sitting on a beach, Outer Banks, North Carolina, summer of 19, and I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, which if you have any, any kind of um, interest in real estate, you've probably heard of this book because um, it's changed so many lives. And I read it in two days. And I remember telling Christina, uh, sitting right next to me on the beach, I said, babe, I'm going to be a real estate investor. And she was kind of like, yeah, okay, Tim, you know, whatever you say, pal, you know, because she's always been <laughs> very supportive of everything I've done. She knows that I'm very industrious. I've always kind of come through. I've always put the family first. Uh, I'm not reckless uh, with money or anything like that, or, you know, even time. Um, I'm very intentional. So she knew that I was, I was going to do it. You know, uh, she just didn't want to be involved. And that was July of 19. By November of 19, I was closing on my first rental property, which was a three unit uh, rental um, that I bought with a friend. And I can go over the specifics about why I did a three unit versus a, a single family. Uh, but that really put me on the trajectory of real estate. And I ended up retiring as a nurse. <clears throat> Um, in short order. And I be, I started Cityside Capital almost right away. And I got into the multifamily real estate syndication space, which sounds like a lot, but I know we're going to talk about it today and we're going to break mm -hmm. it down and make it real easy. Yeah, that, it's, it's a wild story. And it's funny you talk about those books, which we're going to link in the notes, because if you haven't read those books, I've read one of them. Um, 
And I'm going to, you, when you started explaining the whole quadrant thing, I was like, Oh, tell me more. That sounds really interesting. I mean, I, I, yeah. I can gander where it goes, but <clears throat> you know, those aha moments that you have, they always seem to happen at the beach. Uh, I don't know. It's where you're finally in that, that comfortable, yeah. peaceful place, right? You have those epiphanies, mm-hmm. you're disconnected from everything, but um, you, the fact that, that in just knowing where you are today, which we're going to get into that story. And, and really in just a couple short years, you, you made that commitment, you had that aha moment, but it's funny how, as you're telling that story, you talk about how you're an employee and almost your measuring stick for success for a lot of people in those younger years. So for those who are listening, listen up is, you know, our measuring stick, I think is often how much money we're putting in our bank account. How hard are we working? How many hours are we grinding? And then you get to the point, you're like, well, wait a second, I have a lot of money now. I have all these things. And what I actually really want is my time back, right? Mm-hmm. So um, you're measuring, your measuring stick changes to this more idea, this idea of, of creating streams of passive income, which is, I know, a big thing that we're going to discuss today with, with multifamily investing. So it's, it's, I think it's important for people to realize when you start to pick that track, um, I mean, tell me if you agree, Tim, that, that I think a lot of us, we, we take that, uh, I don't know if it's, it's the American way of, of and mindset of we have to have all these things uh, and we have to, and we have to work really hard for it. And for every hour we work um, is we get a dollar to be able to go buy that thing. It's, it's just not the right mindset. Well, yeah, I mean, um, we could, you know, we, we could probably talk for hours about this, right? I mean, the, the way that I grew up, I'm 39 years old, and the way that I grew up was probably like a lot of your listeners and probably like yourself. Um, it was, you know, go to school, get a really mm-hmm. good job, right? Um, you know, work as much as you can, save as much as you can, 401k. Uh, max, out, yeah. max out your 401k because it's free money, right? Especially if there's a match. Oh, my goodness. I mean, mm-hmm. um, you know, save enough and you want to buy a house, you know, and 0.5 um, kids, right? Have a couple yeah. of kids, right? And then, you know, save the money in the five to nines and live below your means. Have an, you know, buy, don't buy a new car, buy a used car, you know, and then when you're 65, you know, then you can start living. And I mean, look, I mean, that's, that's, listen, um, I forget his name. He wrote The Millionaire Next Door, um, Tom something. It's a great book, right? And that was written in 1996 or 1997 when the stock market was cooking and people's home prices were appreciating like crazy. People were feeling great about their financial situations, right? Pre, pre 9-11. And, um, you know, that was kind of like the mantra, right? Well, you know, what's happened and what I've come across is that our financial um, landscape, the economical landscape of America has kind of changed. Um, you know, we were talking before, you know, the show started about, you know, what's going on with inflation now and everything. You know, there's there's a significant lack of financial intelligence and financial education in our country. And what I mean is that, like, you know, they might they might spend a day maybe, uh, you know, teaching you how to balance a checkbook in high school or something. Uh, but what we don't talk about is taxes and, you know, insurance and loans and real estate and um, how to invest and stock market and um, maybe, you know, different, different ways to try to make money. Right. Um, because, you know, the way our parents grew up, you know, when they save money in, in a savings account, they probably got six, four to six to 10%, uh, depending on the, the time, you know, your parents were alive, right. Um, in a savings account. And that meant something, you know, but these days, you know, I, I, I dare anybody to try to get 1% in a, a savings account or a CD. It's, uh, it's not likely. Um, and then, you know, so, so when I had this financial transition and I've been a voracious reader of, of content, you know, specifically books, uh, blogs, you know, and then podcasts, forget about it. I mean, if I go to the supermarket five minutes away, I try to get five minutes of a podcast in, you know, because what I realize is that I don't know what I don't know. And there's a mm-hmm. lot that I don't know. And, you know, I, I had to find out more. And it literally, it's, it's almost like the lights were turned on. And, you know, when you listen to all these podcasts, Derek, I don't know if you feel like this. 
you know, but I, I felt like, you know, people would talk about mentorship and coaching and getting around people uh, that are doing the thing that you want to do. And I was kind of like, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I can do it by myself. I'll read mm-hmm. a couple of books, I'll, you know, I'll subscribe to Audible. Maybe I'll listen to a book, too, while I'm at it, you know, and I'll figure it out. And that's kind of how I did it my whole life. Right. If I wanted to learn a new sport, I figured it out. If I wanted to, you know, whatever, play an instrument, I, I tried to figure it out. I'm, I'm not very good at instruments, but, you know, but anything that you're defiantly committed to uh, learning about, you know, um, what I found was when you get around the right people and you get around the right content, literally anything is possible, but you really have to start no matter what you're going to do with the education piece. I, I, I'm going to pause you there for a minute because <clears throat> what you said there is just, the, I, I think the fundamental piece of change is the fact that you just admitted the fact that you really know nothing. And I don't mean it like you know nothing, but you, you, if you have this mindset, like I know it all, you're not going to seek new knowledge. You're not going to learn. You're not going to listen to five minutes of a podcast and your way to pick up bananas and Brussels sprouts. So the fact that you've committed to that is, I think, a big reason why you've been so successful so quickly is because you're constantly consuming content to improve. Because the only way we're going to be any more successful is if we improve our value. The only way you can improve our value is if we improve our knowledge, right? So the fact that you've committed to that is huge. And I think people look at things like you probably could have looked at real estate and been like, this is too confusing. Like that's how I view real estate. We've got a few multifamilies and stuff, but when I look at it, I go, that's confusing. There's a lot that I just don't understand. Part of the reason why you're on the show. And, but once you commit to it and you commit to that education, you and have the confidence to know that you can learn anything. Like one day, mm-hmm. like you couldn't walk, Tim, right? Like you were born, you didn't, like right. now you're walking and talking quite well, I might add. So <laughs> if people can realize that, hey, listen, you learn to walk and talk. Um, there's, and the person who you're consuming this education from one day, they didn't know shit about that, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't just wake up an expert. Um, then I think we can start to bridge that gap between, you know, being afraid and actually doing it. So I, sorry to pause you there, but it, you just no, you, you hit, that's perfect. You hit a thorn, man. Yeah. So please continue. Yeah, and I, I just want, I want to stack on top of what you just said, right. You know, also being like a man or being like a New Yorker, like, I don't want to admit if I don't know something, or I don't want to mm-hmm. admit a weakness or, you know, um, you know, if it comes to finances, like you don't usually go to a party and talk about like how much money you have in the bank account or how, what kind of, you know, whatever, but like, you know, if, if we all realize at the end of the day, like I'm a, I'm a married father of three beautiful little tiny girls who I want everything to be perfect for, right? It's not so different from Derek Peterson. It's not so different from my brother, Greg, or from the guy next door or the guy who's at the, the, the gas station. Everybody at the end of the day wants to have a little bit more. They want to do better than the previous generation. They want to provide for the next generation. Everybody's kind of on the same path. Yet nobody really wants to talk about what they don't know. Like, I I don't know how to do real estate, Tim. So instead of talking to you about it and maybe finding out a little bit more, I'm just going to like not talk about it or, you know, investing or money or, you know, uh, because nobody ever wants to be vulnerable. Nobody ever wants to be like the guy to throw his hand up, be like, I need help, you know. But at the end of the day, like, that's why I'm so super passionate about talking to investors, whether you're a seasoned investor or a brand new investor, like, I want to dive in. I want to see like, you know, what, what, what have you been doing that's working? Maybe I don't know something. I should be doing something different too, you know, or, you know, what do you want to know? Or, you know, how how can we add value to you? And, you know, it sounds a little cliche, like no judgment. Right. But there's a ton of people we've raised millions of dollars in the last, like say year and a half. Right. And a lot of it has come from blue collar people, like firefighters and cops and nurses and PAs and stuff like that. But a lot of it has come from these high net worth people who um, have made a ton of money, whether it's in a, uh, a small business or a corporate world or, you know, uh, physicians and surgeons, yet they had no financial training. They had no financial education. So they, just, they took the traditional route of the 401ks and CDs and they, and they had a guy, right? They had a guy at, you know, uh, the bank who is advising them on, you know, stocks and whatever. And that's a great way to go if you don't want to put any effort into it, right? And what I always say is that if you want to be average, even though you make a lot of money on a yearly basis, like that's an average way to grow your wealth. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you wanted more, if you wanted to do more for, for yourself and your family, 
you know, that's when you got to get around people and build your team. I'm huge. We're a huge sports family, right? So we're always talking about, you know, how do you fill the spots on the team? And if you build a team around you and you have a good real estate guy, a good accountant, a good attorney, uh, a good guy that can, can help you with the stock market, um, you can really diversify in a great way, but you have to really kind of build a team or get that education and get around people that are doing some of the things that you want to do as well. You are the culmination of the five people you hang around the most, right? So you surround yourself. That. You know that, yeah. Jim Rohn. We talked about that before. Yeah, Jimmy Rohn. Um, and it doesn't need to be you're physically surrounded by him. It could be you're listening to Jim Rohn's book, right? You know, you're listening to Kiyosaki, Kawasaki, Kiyosaki, Kiyosaki's book. Um, yeah. I always struggle with that dude's name. So yeah, it, it's just, again, a testament to the, uh, to the education and the work that you've put in and you know, here you are 2019, you said you bought your first, uh, your first three family. Um, and now we're what we're two years out and city side capital is on fire right now with real estate syndication. So I can, um, you know, doing some work with Tim, um, uh, professionally and just getting to know him and his brother personally, these guys are literally on fire. That's not a cliche to what he does for a living, but it fits nicely. So with that said, um, Let's segue for a second. Let's let's yeah. talk about real estate syndication. What the heck is real estate syndication? Can you explain it to people uh, and what it is? And just in in one on one, like we're like you're talking to a group of six year olds. All right, cool. Real estate syndication sounds like a big scary term, but it's really nothing more than a group investment, right? So, um, could you, Derek, you know, get you know some money and go buy a condo, um, put twenty five percent down run it yourself, get renters in there Take you know, yes, you can do that, right? You can do that with a single family. I was able to do it with a, a three family, but you know, it makes sense, right? And that's what a lot of real estate investors do in the beginning is, you know, they want to have control. They want to do it. They don't want to have to rely on anybody else because it's their money and they care a lot about that. They don't want to lose money. So they'll say, you know what, you know, what's safe, Derek, a one family, right? I'm going to do a one family house. I'll get, you know, one renter in. And, you know, what they do is like after three or four or five years, you know, um, they'll realize that in between renters, they'll have like three months of, you know, maybe downtime. And, and then in that downtime, they have to do some repairs. Um, and then they get a renter in there. So they're always kind of chasing yield. And it's not as sexy as they, they heard it was in the books or the seminars, and they say, you know what? Real estate sucks. Um, I'm going to sell this house. Uh, I tried it. It, it kind of sucked. It was a time suck. You know, uh, the hot water heater went. It was an $800 thing. And, you know, I had this tenant that was a pain in the butt. They didn't pay on time. They always had a story. You know, it, 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 it's not for me. Real estate's not for me. And then it's kind of like they're, they're ruined, right? And then everybody they talk to, uh, they're like, oh, dude, don't do real estate. It's terrible. Let me tell you what happened to me. Syndication is a way to kind of circumvent that, right? Um, it, again, it's building out your team. So with syndication, especially in multifamily that we kind of, uh, that's the sandbox we play in, is, you know, there's a certain way to evaluate it. There's a certain way to run it. There's a certain way to uh, use it as a, uh, a wealth building, you know, vehicle, but you have, to have, you have to have a team in place. So what we do is we connect investors with those multifamily opportunities and then you can become what's called a passive investor. So if you want to put $100,000 or $50,000 into a passive investment, you know, the way that we structure the deals is that you are like an owner of real estate. So you get to uh, take part in the appreciation, the cash flow of the property. You get the tax benefits through depreciation and like the other operating expenses. Um, you get the mortgage paid down by the tenants, right? Uh, you have the hedge against inflation. So like you're really profiting five ways from real estate, uh, but you're not getting the phone call for the hot water heater. You're not getting the phone call for the non-payment of rent. Like we have a team in place that handles all of that, uh, handles all the reporting, handles all the maintenance. So, you know, it's a way to be involved in real estate and get all the benefits of real estate without having the headache of being the landlord. Yeah. And I think that's a great story you tell about, because I've been there, uh, having those small rental units and it's, yeah, you, you're like, oh, I can do the landlord thing. I can fix a toilet, but it starts to become a nuisance. And like you said, people end up leaving and not wanting to, uh, to stick with it and stick with real estate. But with multifamily, you're dealing with typically, you know, 
the term true multifamily, you're talking about 20, 30, uh, somewhere, sometimes hundreds of units um, mm -hmm. where me as a passive investor, I can own basically a piece or a parcel of, of that investment. So mm -hmm. where normally I wouldn't be able to go buy a three to $5 million, uh, you know, multi, you know, unit complex, I, I can now have uh, a piece of it and still get those benefits. Correct. Hundred percent. So, you know, uh, when you talk about real estate, um, and you can stop me at any time because I can talk about this. I'm so passionate about. It, I can talk about it all day. But, you know, when you hear the term residential real estate, that's really talking about one to four units, right? So, with residential real estate, um, like a lot of people will start off with a duplex and they'll live in one, live, 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 you know, live on one side and rent out the other, right? That's a safe bet for them. That's a safe way to get started. And it's how I tell all the young people that I talk to in their 20s, if you can find a duplex, try to get a duplex or a triplex or, or, or a quad, right? Live in one of the units. You can get, you can qualify for an FHA loan, three and a half percent down, um, or, you know, um, you know, you know, it's called house hacking or whatever, but, you know, that's residential, right? You can qualify for, you know, financing under your name and you can get a 30 year amortizing loan at say, I don't know, two and a half, three percent right now. So that's a way to, that's one way to do it. And the reason why it's, I chose the three family in the beginning is because I'm a conservative guy. I don't have a ton of money to lose, quote unquote, lose in real estate. Right. So I didn't want to do the single family home because I said to myself, if I lose that, that tenant for whatever reason, um, you know, I'm going to be on the hook for two mortgages, my house and that house. Uh, and that was scary to me. So I, I opted for the three unit because, you know, as long as I had one, like really one and a half units paying rent, that covered all my bills, right? Uh, or or all, all my liabilities for that one property. And then the other one and a half units was the, was the profit center, you know? Um, and that made way more sense to me. So especially if one unit went vacant, I, I was still going to make money on the other two units, right? Or at least, you know, keep my head above water. Um, so anyway, so once I had the proof of concept and we did a little better on our taxes, you know, that, that year, uh, Christina and my wife had the, the proof of concept with the cash flow and everything. Um, we realized that real estate was going to be a viable model. Uh, but at the time that was like my third job, right? I was a firefighter an ER nurse. And then I was like, you know, half hour down to the house, half hour back, you know, if I had to do some work, she was like, dude, you're never home. I'm like, I know. So I really got involved in some of the podcasts about the multifamily, but it sounded scary to me. And again, mm -hmm. like uh, New York City firefighter, like, I don't know why I was scared of multifamily, you know, but I was, I was like, wow, spreadsheets and cap rates and net operating income. And that sounds like something that hedge fund people do on Wall Street it didn't seem like something I could do. Um, but then I was determined. I had like, you know, I always call it defiantly committed. I was defiantly committed to learning how I can do it because Derek, I was hearing all of these people on podcasts and they were teachers and cops and firemen and small business owners. And, you know, and they're all making it happen in multifamily. I'm saying, wait a minute, you know, if they, if they can find the time and their parents, um, they have lives, right. They have jobs, W2 jobs. If they can do it, you know, I can certainly do it, you know? So I retired from the hospital and I, uh, ended up getting, uh, some coaching, um, uh, about multifamily because, I can tell you there's a metamorphosis about coaching because like we talked about before, I'm very skeptical by nature, right? Um, I always joke that I have some, uh, I have a healthy dose of skepticism baked directly into my DNA being from the, the New York City area um, about not trusting anybody or anything or any process, right? So uh, when I heard people on podcasts talking about coaching and mentors and paying for it, I was like, why would you ever pay for a coach? Why would you ever pay for a mentor? Like, you know, go read a book or go, you know, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, but there I was like in like six months later, I'm like, Christina, I'm like, we got to pay for coaching because the value of coaching was you immediately tap into a network of a couple of hundred people that are doing the thing that I wanted to do, that they were uh, experienced. I immediately got hooked up with, you know, an accountability coach, a deal coach, an underwriting coach, um, an accountability pod, which doesn't sound, it might sound a little foo-foo to people, but when you have an accountability call every week or every two weeks, and you haven't done anything that week and you got to face the music with somebody holding you accountable, it changes the game, right? So, all right, cool, Tim, you got three kids and you're coaching uh, girls across in basketball and you have a W2 job. Yeah, so do we. So, and this is what we did. We called 10 brokers. We got three deals. We submitted two LOIs and, you know, whatever. 
Um, you know, so it was, it was intense, right? So there's a whole bunch of education modules, uh, a whole bunch of phone calls and network. And by the way, I started this March of 2020, where COVID was literally coming on our shore or was on our shore. We just didn't know it yet. A uh, hell of a time to get into real estate and multifamily and try raising uh, millions of dollars from people, right? With the economic uncertainty out there and the stock market crash. Three weeks later, it went down by 33%, the S&P. Um, so, you know, hell of a time to get started, but I didn't care. Right. Um, and as a little side note, you know, I started this coaching and that's when COVID came on our shores. And I work in a very poor neighborhood in New York city in the borough of Queens. And, um, there's a lot of people on top of people, right. And COVID spread like wildfire. And, uh, about the third week in, in March, maybe the fourth week, we started doing CPR nonstop all day, 24 hours. I would get back in the rig. I would go to the touchscreen computer and hit in service and another CPR run would pop up. And usually we get some people back in CPR. Derek, nobody's making it, right? Nobody's making it. The local trauma center has two refrigerated trucks to store all the bodies. Um, it was scary. We didn't know what we know now about COVID. And I had a six month old at the time. So I moved out of my house. Uh, my wife and I made the decision that we didn't know enough and I was doing all these crazy things at work. So I moved out of my house into my mother-in-law's house and she moved into my house to help out with the kids. And for eight weeks, I had no contact with my family, no physical contact at all. Right. And I had just joined this coaching program and this education program. And, um, you know, it was a hard time. Right. I mean, like I could have like totally yeah. shut down and been felt sorry for myself. But what I did was I recognized that this was an opportunity to, although I miss my kids dearly, um, and that was really hard. I woke up at five o'clock every morning and I went to bed at like midnight and I just did content consumption. And I went through all the modules and I took notes and I was reading books and I was listening to podcasts. Um, literally for, for the entire day, I was taking some sort of content and that really kind of put me ahead of the pack. And by the end of the eight weeks, I was calling brokers and community bankers and trying to get financing and underwriting. And, you know, uh, I, I had my brother, Greg, you know, traveling all over, you know, the, the Carolinas and, and Virginia, uh, trying to find properties and walking properties that, you know, that we were finding and stuff. And um, had I not done that, I don't know that we would have had the, um, the really the rise to kind of the success that we've seen so far so quick. Um, but you know, that was really kind of, you know, how we got started. Uh, but I'll throw it back to you. And that, 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 I, I wasn't aware of that story, man, that I didn't even think of the COVID factor, the fact that you moved out, but you took a challenging situation, you turned it into something completely positive, uh, and made the most of it, which, um, you're right. I think most people would feel sorry for themselves. They'd be depressed. Um, but you, you, you flipped it and turned it into an opportunity. And I think, for those who, who did that during those, you know, those first call, call eight weeks of COVID, um, you know, hats off to you because it's, it's not an easy switch to flip, you know, and Tim, I mean, you did a phenomenal job with that. So, so here you are, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're starting your, your journey now with Cityside Capital at the height of COVID, you're consuming all this content. Um, let's pause for a second and let's actually talk about, because I think it'll add more context as you get deeper into it, explain to people the benefits of real estate as an asset class, right? Because there's a lot of options mm -hmm. out there when it comes to asset classes. Do I go self-storage, stocks, bonds, crypto, whatever? There's all this stuff out there. Why multifamily real estate? Help people understand that. And then we'll kind of dive into your journey on, on where Cityside is today. Cool. Um, and this is like right up my alley, right? So there's really five ways real estate can pay you. Uh, number one is the cash flow, right? If the property that you're looking to buy doesn't cash flow, we say you let the grass grow, you move on, right? Uh, because the idea is to put as many assets in your asset column um, as you can, but the ones that are paying you cash every month, right? Um, you know, liability is basically something that takes money out of your pocket every month. And an asset is something that puts money into your pocket every month. And if you keep that context, uh, while looking at, you know, or starting your real estate journey, um, you want to, you know, you want to have that cash flow. That's number one. Number two is the tax benefits. You know, there's something called depreciation and we can spend a whole hour talking about depreciation benefits and bonus depreciation and cost segregation studies. 
But just know that, like, you know, there's paper losses in real estate. There's a reason why Donald Trump doesn't pay, uh, you know, love him or hate him. There's a reason why he doesn't pay any taxes, right? He uses the tax laws that are already out there, uh, which is basically the government saying, you know, we need help with affordable, clean, safe, affordable housing. And if you help us with that, we'll give you tax breaks, right? Um, so, you know, cash flow, there's uh, tax benefits, there's amortization, right? So, you know, amortization just means paying down uh, one's loan. So, you know, instead of you paying it down, the tenants that you have, they're paying it down. They're paying the bills, they're paying the insurance, they're paying the mortgage, right? Um, and they're they're contributing to your cash flow. Um, the fourth thing is it's a it's it's a, a hedge against inflation. And a lot of times people will say that, and they don't really know what it means, right? So, if you picture right now, if you have uh, say I think they're saying our CPI right now, consumer price inflation uh, index is showing inflation of about five point two percent. Let's just call it five percent. So if you have $100,000 in the, in, the, in the checking account right now, um, you're, lo- you're losing 5% of those on a yearly basis in purchasing power, right? So if you're not making 5% on your money, you're not basically, br- you'd be breaking even. If you, if you found a very safe you know, uh, savings account out there that was yielding 5%, that would be great. You're, you're keeping up with inflation. So when you invest in real estate, obviously you want to have a higher yield than whatever's out there. So real estate's awesome because you can use leverage, which is the fifth way you can get paid, which simply means loans, right? So you can get a loan at say 3% right now or 3.5%, which is lower than the 5% inflation. So that's a one and a half percent delta that you're already kind of ahead of the game. Then the cash flow, right? So you're getting cash flow above and beyond that 5%. So, and the best thing about this is even if inflation grows to say seven or 10%, in multifamily specifically, we have one year contracts with the tenants, right? You sign a lease, it's generally for 12, sometimes 18 months. Um, So each year when a, a, a unit comes up for renewal, you know, you can kind of gauge as a landlord saying, you know, all right, well, inflation is now 7%. You know, I need to raise this X amount, you know, to kind of keep up or get ahead of inflation. So you're having one year contracts with all your residents and you can increase the rent. And usually as inflation uh, grows, so do the cost of living of basically everything, including housing. So, you know, you're not the only landlord in town that's raising rents. Everybody's raising rents because they're trying to keep up with inflation, right? So that's one of the benefits is that you can stay ahead of inflation. You can be dollars ahead nominally by investing in real estate, specifically multifamily. Now, listen, could you do um, retail? Yeah, retail, but you're, they're usually five month lease, uh, five year leases, uh, like on big box stores and stuff like that. And sometimes they have like a step up agreement, like, all right, this is going to go up, every, you know, every two uh, percent every year, three percent every year. Um, but that's one of the benefits of multifamily is a shorter contract terms with your tenants. So if you if you put it all out there, you got cash flow, you got the people paying off your loan, your amortization, you got tax benefits, right? So you can, you know, uh, and I'll talk about income in a second. You got uh, leverage and you got an, an, uh, with loans, right? You can get other people's money to help you magnify those uh, gains. And then you have the hedge against inflation. Now, what I always talk about people uh, with investors, even like my high net worth people, um, you know, who have made way more money than I have ever, uh, they'll be like, Tim, like, I thought you were a firefighter and an ER nurse. How do you know so much about this? Right. And it's because I've been defiantly committed to this process. I live this stuff. I eat this stuff up. But what I found was the more I dug deep into my financial education, there's really three buckets of income, right? You have what's called your earned income. Uh, or ordinary income, that's one bucket. You have portfolio income, which is bucket number two, and that's your stocks and bonds and uh, crypto, stuff like that, right? And then you have what's called passive income, right? So your bucket number one, your ordinary income, that's your W-2, your 1099 income, your interest income on like a savings account or CD, something like that. And that's all taxed at uh, your ordinary income tax rate. So if you're in the 32% tax, you know, bracket, that's, that's your rate, right? If you're in 24, if you're in the 37 uh, point, uh, you know, six, if you're in the highest one, that's, that's what you're paying on bucket number one. And that's by and large how everybody, or a lot of people in our country, the majority of our country makes their money, right? The bucket number two um, could be taxed two ways. And the reason why I'm harping on taxes is because if you figure out your tax strategy, 
Taxes are people's like number one um, liability. And if you can figure out with a strategy about how to keep more of what you make legally, because it's all, it's all out there for you. You just got to find the, the, the person, the team to help you, the CPA to help you, you know? So bucket number two is either long-term capital gains. If you own something for a year and a day, like if you own a stock for a year and a day or something, it's long-term capital gains. Right. Um, Or if you, you know, if you're day trading, that's ordinary income. Right. Um, So that's portfolio income bucket. Number two, bucket number three is magic. Okay. Passive income bucket, all rental cash flow, all like real estate cash flow, is, it falls under the passive income guidelines uh, in the IRS uh, guidelines, right? So the cash flow from your rental property, whether you're a passive investor w- with uh, some of the projects that we're doing or something like that, or you're an active investor, uh, you know, buying your own two, four family units, whatever, you know, that, that falls into bucket number three, passive income. And the beauty of that is that passive losses will offset that passive income. Now, I'm going to have a little, just quick disclaimer. I'm not a CPA. Uh, you always have to check with your own CPA, but your own, you know, <laughs> all, all those disclaimers, right? But if you think about it, you know, you can be getting paid cash flow from a property and that falls into the passive income bucket. And at the end of the year, you know, with the help of your CPA, you can say, all right, well, what's our depreciation capture, right? Uh, what can we write off as far as depreciation? Uh, well, guess what? That is a paper loss. That's a phantom loss. You're not losing money, but on paper you are, right? So you can offset your income for the year with those paper losses. Your Mm -hmm. mortgage interest deduction is another thing, right? Some of the operating or capital expenditures. So there's all these different ways that you can offset this third bucket of income, which is passive income. Now you can get it from royalties from books. You can get it from, you know, other things too. There's other ways to make passive income. But, you know, once I got that financial education, I'm saying, whoa, I'm on the wrong side. I'm concentrating on the wrong bucket, right? I'm taking overtime in the firehouse to increase my W-2 income, yet I'm paying the highest amount of taxes with the least amount of uh, tax write-offs, you know? So I really had a, so I retired from the hospital and I started Cityside Capital. What we did was we, we, we created a company to not only talk to investors um, and just let people know what's out there, what's available to them, you know, but really get into the multifamily space. And, you know, when I was in this group, I had the opportunity of a lifetime. My coach was from New York and he's a syndicator, uh, which means he puts these big multifamily properties under contract. And then he gets, you know, the group investing going and he raises capital from investors and he takes down these properties and he returns, uh, you know, distributions every month to the investors. And at the end of the day, when they sell it in a couple of years, they all split the profits. So he's done that six, seven times at this point. And he gave, he, he, you know, he, he took a liking to me in the beginning. I was always asking him, how can I add value to you, Chris? Um, I'll go mow the lawn at one of your properties, dude. Like, you know, how, you know, how, how can I learn more from you? You know, I was always trying to add value. And he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime to join him on his seventh syndication, which was a 43 unit property in Pennsylvania, uh, 5.7 million. And when, when I thought about that, I'm like, wow, like I'm going to be a general partner in a $5.7 million property. I couldn't even wrap my head around that, right? I mean, like, I never thought I'd be able to do that. But he was giving me this opportunity to do the due diligence and watch how he does the underwriting and how does he get the financing and the insurance and how are we going to asset manage this property? And and what are are the upgrades going to be? And what does the business plan include? And all these things. And I got this incredible, incredible guy to work with and show me the ropes and at the end of the day, he tell we're about to close on the property and now he's doing his investor calls. And he's like, you know, Tim, you think you could raise any money? And I was like, I have no idea. Like, you know, I had been talking to some of my ecosystem about my three family property and people would always kind of be like, how'd you do it? How'd you finance it? How'd you do the down payment? How'd you do this? So people knew I was kind of invest, investing in real estate, but they didn't know I was doing multifamily, right? It's a COVID lockdown. No one's, no one's seeing each other except for Zoom calls, right? Um, so now I'm like putting out emails to my ecosystem, like, hey, you know, <laughs> I got this opportunity. It's a $5.7 million property. Here are the return, you know, uh, structures. And this is what you can get. And this is what, and people would call me and be like, dude, what are you doing? Like, I thought you were a fireman and ear nurse. You know, you're talking about real estate. Um, so I wasn't exactly sure I could raise any money. We ended up raising 150000 for that first deal. Because what I found was, people want to be diversified outside of the stock market. You know, um, 
the more people learn about the current financial picture, using leverage, using a team, real estate, benefits, tax planning, it all makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, does having a Fidelity account or a Vanguard account or uh, some crypto, does that make sense? Yeah, of course, right? Like You need, you need to uh, diversify and and uh, as long as you feel confident, right, you're educated in what you're doing, like, by all means, by, you know, do that. But people, once they learn about, you know, maybe the uh, return structures or, you know, the tax benefits, and all of a sudden the light goes off and they say, wow, like, I need to investigate this some more, you know. Um, so I raised 150000 And at that point, I just realized that, you know, I could, I'm passionate about this. I can talk about it all day long. And people want this. People want to have the opportunity to at least evaluate these deals. So, you know, Greg and I, my brother Greg, he's down in Virginia and um, he had some real estate experience with his current W-2 job and the one that, that he had before that doing some condo complex development in Boise, Idaho. Um, so we just said, you know what, well, let's, let's make a go at this. Let's really kind of lean into it. Let's tell people what we're doing. Let's build this brand. Let's build this business. Um, and one deal led to two, which has now led to uh, eight. And we have like 250 million of assets under management, like 1600 doors, um, which is like kind of like cool to say. Uh, but really what we're doing is we're providing vetted opportunities to everyday investors who want to get involved in real estate, but they don't necessarily want to be the people taking the phone calls, getting the financing, doing due diligence. Uh, you know, asset managing, right? But they want to have the benefits of cash flow, of tax, uh, you know, uh, tax benefits. And, you know, there's been a tremendous demand. So we, we've been able to be very successful in a very short amount of time uh, because of it. Yeah. And I think that that success is a testament to your commitment to education. I, I mean, that, that seems what to has resonated. And also the fact that you're a uh, Obviously, you put in the time, you put in the work, and you take a tremendous amount of action. You hired coaches that held you accountable. You, you did all the right things. But here's an example of a guy that was, you know, a New Yorker, a firefighter, a nurse. And yeah, you start seeing cap rate and leverage and all these fancy terms. And they probably look like, you know, another language to you. Now you're spitting them off yeah. like no one's business. In just a couple of years, and 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 to have the amount of assets under management that you have, the number of doors, it's such an incredible story. And I think it gives credence to the fact that, you know, if if you commit to it, if you put the time in, you put the work in, you can change your life in such a short period of time. Because I've had the privilege of of being um, an acquaintance of yours and connected with you in social, and it's just been such a blast to watch your journey, man. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I, I really hats off to you, your work, you and your brother, uh, what you guys have put in and, uh, you, you continue to be a voice in this community as well. I mean, you're on every podcast imaginable in the multifamily space. So, uh, you, you've really done an outstanding job. And, and I think you've really allowed our listeners to understand, you know, what, what multifamily is the benefits of multifamily, um, and, and why they would want to work with somebody like you. So let's, let's pause for a second. Actually, let's, let's, let's talk about that. Right. So there's obviously gonna be some people that listen to this and say, Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> you know, I, I think I may be interested in, in investing in multifamily now that I understand it a little bit better. How, how does someone get in contact with you? Yeah. So we are actually in the process of, uh, launching our own podcast. Thanks to Derek, um, you Derek, right. But, uh, we haven't done that quite yet, but the easiest way would be to go to our website, citysidecap.com. Um, that's C I T Y S I D E cap.com. And what, what we've tried to do is, you know, we, we do blog posts and I know people don't like to read that much anymore, but, uh, we're in the process of doing some video series as well. Um, uh, but I try to write these, you know, blog posts that are written for the everyday investor keep the technicality you know to a minimum uh but really kind of tell them you know these these seemingly hard concepts and breaking it down into small easy pieces right uh because it does sound scary i was nervous about it right but when i jumped in and i started investing my own money getting uh educated by doing um and then finding out that there's a real appetite out there I wanted to break it down for people just like me. I have I have myself in mind when I write these blog posts. Uh, so that's a great way to do it. Um, uh, 
I also, you know, whether or not you even want to invest with us at Cityside Capital or you want to just talk about real estate, I pretty much take every call, right? Um, I've had some incredible connections through COVID uh, with Zoom calls and phone calls uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's one, like, and we talked about this before, people don't want to talk about finances generally and, you know, where they are and where they think they should be and comparing yourself to everybody. That's not me. Right. I, I, I'll take the gloves off. I'll talk to you about exactly, you know, where I am, uh, how I did it, you know, how I can assist you, add value to you, where you want to go. Because really, there's a million ways to make money in real estate. And this is just one way. This is just the way that we do it. Uh, but there's note investing, there's flipping, there's, you know, burr strategies, there's house hacking, there's, you know, triple net leases. I mean, there's so much to do in real estate. Um, you know, and this is just one way, but it's the way that, you know, uh, we found it's passive, it's, it's profitable, it's scalable. Um, you know, we always joke that the people need three things, food, clothing, and a place to live. Right. Um, and we're not, you know, we're not trying to kill people with rent or anything. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, like we're, we're, we're just doing what other people have done for millennia. Uh, and why not having a blue collar New York city firefighter ER nurse, uh, help you along that journey. Right. Um, I've done it. I've, I've done it for other people. Um, and I'd be more than happy to chat. So citysidecap.com is a good place to start. Awesome. And before I ask my last question, um, you, you, you say the word several times throughout this entire thing is the word passive income. And I think that people, um, that word needs to resonate with you. You told your story being away, being away from your family, working two jobs, coming home late, waking up early. And I think it was, um, I think it was Buffett says, if you don't learn to make money while you sleep, you'll work until you die. Right. Um, and it doesn't sound so hot, right. <laughs> it doesn't sound really good, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that now that you're in this, uh, in this new journey where you're generating streams of passive income for yourself, but for so many other people, again, it's just such a tremendous service and value that you're providing to people because we talked to him in the beginning about, that measuring stick for success it doesn't really need to be income. Listen, we need it, right? We need to live. We need it to be able to enjoy those things. But, but what passive income gives us, I think, at least in my mind, please tell me if you agree, is it gives you your time back. Yeah, there's a metric that Greg and I use all the time. It's called ROTI, right? I mean, every, everyone's kind of familiar with ROI, return on investment. Uh, but we talk about return on time invested. Um, and that's really kind of a significant metric that we try to use with our investors and, and just with ourselves, right? Um, and passive income is one of those things where it's kind of like a cliche term and it kind of turns people off. Um, it sounds foo-foo or it sounds fake, right? Um, but really, once you once you learn about what the possibilities are, what's out there, you know, um, all these are done, you know, under SEC exemptions, right, um, with private placements, uh, and people have been doing it for, for hundreds of years. Um, but if you didn't know somebody who was doing it, you didn't know that they were available to you, right? So now people are finding out, like, oh, my God, like, this is available, right? So all of a sudden, people want to say, um, I want to have 10 grand a month or 15 grand a month in passive income. Well, guess what? Like that doesn't happen uh, overnight, right? But you got to start somewhere, right? So my first fifty thousand dollar investment had a seven percent return uh, in year one. So I was getting monthly deposits into my account of two ninety one sixty seven, and you know now I have a whole bunch of those, right? So um, you know, but you got to start somewhere, right? And it doesn't happen overnight. Um, if you want to get rich quick scheme, city side capital is definitely not where you go. Um, but, you know, it's it's one of those things that you can build over time. Um, there's all sorts of creative ways. I mean, during during COVID, I tapped into my 401k, which is actually called the 457 for for me. Uh, and I was able to extract one hundred thousand dollars out of my uh, retirement fund with no penalty. And the tax liability was spread out over three years. I mean, that's one way that I helped uh, fund some of my multifamily uh, purchases. Right. Uh, but there's other ways too. I mean, there's, there's a ton of ways and I'd be happy to explore uh, all that with, uh, with any of your listeners. Awesome. No, and I appreciate that. So I always ask the same question at the end of every show. We've talked for a better part of an hour. You talked about your story. You talked about benefits of multifamily. You talked about um, your journey. And if people were to forget everything you just said and only leave with just one nugget that they could take with them to help them 
better their position financially or better their lives, really sort of change their financial position. Um, Cause that's really a lot of what this show is like, or change their life. You know, what is, from what you've learned, what your journey has brought you through, what would be that one thing, that one nugget that Tim would be like, Hey, take this with you, forget everything else I said, what would that be? Commit and take action, you know, commit to that financial education and then you have to take action, right? It's really, you know, you can go to one more seminar. You can always listen to one more podcast. You can buy six more books on Amazon. It's very easy. Um, but it's the application of that knowledge that is going to move the needle for, for everybody. So if you commit to something such as financial education, real estate investing, um, it's really applying and taking action that's really going to move the needle for you um, and give you that proof of concept. Awesome. Tim. As always, brother, it's a pleasure chatting chat with you. Thanks so much for coming on talking to our listeners, man. I really do appreciate it. Uh, we'll, we'll put all the links Thank inside you. the show notes for people to get in contact with you, to check out your website, um, because you are a wealth of knowledge and just an awesome dude. So thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Adapt You podcast. We hope that today's show gave you the inspiration, tools, and resources, and just motivation to become and improve and change yourself on your path and on your journey to becoming the absolute best version of yourself. Now, with that said, today's episode is brought to you by Adapt Media Agency, a full service digital marketing agency based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, servicing customers across the globe. So whether you're a small startup business or a large business looking for digital marketing needs, Adapt Media Agency is there to help you with things such as website development, videography, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube advertising, social media management, search engine optimization, pay-per-click advertising, I go on and on and on, but anything digitally marketing related that is going to help you grow your brand and change the way that you're interacting with your companies, Adapt Media Agency is that company for you. So if you wanna learn more information, you can see our links in the mentions below or go to www.adaptmediaagency.com for more information. So thanks again for listening to the show. We hope you had an amazing experience. If you like this show and you felt it uh, did a great job for you, if you're listening to us uh, you know, over, the, over iTunes or one of the podcast channels, please leave us a review. It really helps us grow our brand and grow uh, the show to deliver you greater guests and greater content. And if you're watching on YouTube, please pound that like button, hit the subscribe, and uh, so that way you don't miss uh, another episode here of the Adapt2 Podcast. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next one.